Okay, so I'm down river and uh, I'm right where, I don't know, maybe some of you remember, maybe you won't. Last winter, I came a hike down here to go steal at fishing in the winter. There's two guys on the near side of the river and they were right up here, up in that grass. And I came down to the forest here and I hid behind these big trees and I spotted them. And uh, they didn't know I was there, but I sat behind the tree with a little bit of cover and I intently stared at them to see if there's any reaction. Coincidentally, I don't know if it was me or not, but they got up and packed the shit and left. Now, this is down a logging road south of Port Alberni. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think, man, it looks creepy around here. Look at that. It's creepy. Right? I think it's creepy. Sometimes I think that a place can be creepy only if you make it creepy. If you let it be creepy, right? A lot of it's in your head. And uh, believe me, if it, if it really truly is creepy, you're going to know about it. You're going to feel it. You can't make up that feeling. So I'm just saying uh, a lot of times people get freaked out in the forest just because they are freaking themselves out. I mean, let's think about it. I've seen one of these hairy bastards look at me. If anybody should be freaked out in the woods, it's me, I'll tell you what. But you control it, right? You understand that you grow to learn that death is not something to fear. And now there is anything else. And once you understand that, accept that as true, then you're, you're basically invincible, right? Some of you might kill me, kill my flesh. But oh well, I'll carry on somewhere else. Anyway, I'm gonna set this camera up. Hopefully away from these little rapids because they're loud enough to distort everything and make it harder to hear. And I'm gonna sit up there, I think, and I'll put the camera so you can see down the river maybe. And maybe I'll go up here and face it down this way, I don't know. But this water's a lot more cold <laughs> than, than the river back home because the river behind the house is lake fed. It's easy to swim in. And try to film fish, but this one's freaking cold. It's mountain runoff. So uh, maybe I'll sit, share some videos to try to get up the guts to go in with my underwater camera and see if anything can swim around in there. I know there's summer run steelhead here somewhere. Anyway, I'll get away from this water sound and get some voices heard. All right, so I'm gonna hold the camera. This will be a first. Hope it's not too jiggly. And, uh, any vehicular sound you hear, there's a logging road not too far above me, and it's pretty busy. Pretty busy, even though it's frickin' hot out. See the river? Is that for a, an angle there? Let's see what we got. Let's see if I can pull this off. Let's see what I got. Hundreds. Hundreds. All right, here we go. Type, this is red. This is titled. This is titled, Hold the Camera Steady, You Bastard. <laughs> this is titled, Dread and Terror, followed by seeing true predator-like entities. Hey Steve, this experience happened when I was working graveyard snowmaking at Big Mountain Ski Town, 50 miles south of Lake Tahoe. I'm the only one who saw them, but my coworker was about 1,000 feet away from me walking to work. We're both working in Big Mountain Ski Town, 50 miles south of Lake Tahoe. I was working graveyard snowmaking. It was the beginning of November and the first storm of the season. All of our other co-workers ended being an hour late because of snow on the road this night. And there were about 15 other people living in this town. The pump house that was our base camp for snowmaking was about a half a mile in the tree line outside of the town. So me and this co-worker would normally walk along the street line because it was faster than going through the town with light. This night, once I got to the last building, before I started walking into the trees, the tree line, I was hit with an intense feeling of terror and dread that stopped me in my tracks. I took a second, shone my flashlight around and didn't see anything and noticed my co-worker was walking down the same path, so I decided to walk further. Once I got about 300 feet further, that feeling of dread and terror doubled in intensity. This time when I shined my flashlight into the tree line, I came across the outline of a translucent bipedal entity standing next to a tree. 
and once my light hit it, it crouched down. I first thought I was just seeing shadows, then about 10 seconds later, I see a second one comes out from behind a tree, barely into my light, and I could see it turn its chest towards me. And five seconds later, it walks behind another tree towards the first one. At that point, I was freaked out. I turned around to see where my coworker was, and then I turned back around and couldn't see the first one by the tree, and started jogging backwards to my coworker. The crazy part is when I got to my coworker, he was walking backwards toward me as well, and he said he had the same feeling of fear and terror I did, but also could feel something steering at the back of his head since he left the house. The feeling went away once we met up together, but I've never felt a feeling like that before or since, and I'm very experienced with coming across black bear and mountain lions. I've never felt that. It's, it felt primal, as if it's a warning system built into our DNA from the old times. I told my coworker about what I saw after we were done with snowmaking for the season, and after that, he never wanted to talk about that night again. Now, I still kind of put this experience in the back of my mind and kind of played it off as my mind playing tricks on me until I remembered having the UFO experience about a year ago. If a UFO will lure me out of my house with insane vivid lights, then I don't know. Anything's possible. I really question it now. So the UFO experience happened in May of 2019. I was living at, my, on my, at one of my family farmhouses on their 5,000 acre hop farm up in central Washington, Yakima Valley. I was having trouble sleeping this night and about 1.45 a.m. I decided I was going to go downstairs to smoke a bowl as my room was on the top floor and I smoked in the garage. As soon as I got out of my room, I noticed the entire house is being filled with blue and red light. I have family all along this street. My phone just blanked that story out. Hold on a minute. Well, that was weird. My phone just absolutely blanked out and then uh, went to my home screen. I have family along this street and a cousin and uncle in a different house right across the street from my first. Right across the street, there's lack of punctuation. My first thought was that maybe there was a cop or ambulance at their house because I've had other family in the area that had their house broken into with them in there. Once I walked out to the front door, there were two big willow trees in front of my front yard and right in the middle of both of them in the sky was a flying saucer. A slightly curved metallic top and bottom and the middle was completely square windows at each window and a different color light coming out of them. The colors were blue, red, yellow, green, purple, orange, and the lights breathed all together as they would fade in and out, but always were very bright. My reaction was to take a picture or get it on film, but my camera on my phone wouldn't focus, and the picture I got just looked like a blurry picture of cop lights with a black background. You know how on an iPhone you slid it over to video? Well, I did that. It keep getting bounced back to picture. And after the third time, a message came up saying, video feature unavailable now. After this, I put my phone down and I just steered, stared at the UFO until it left. Now my memory of this should only be about 30 minutes. When I looked at my phone, once the crop was gone, it was almost 3.24 a.m. In my mind, there is no way I stood there for an hour and 40 minutes. A few months later, I started having extremely vivid and continuous UFO invasion dreams. This went on for about two months and then they finally stopped. Man, am I glad they stopped. I didn't get much sleep in those two months. And there you go. How unsettling is that? Especially the two uh, predator-like beings, which you can't deny this shit's being seen and where the hell did Hollywood get that idea from, right? I was thinking the other day, actually, you know, we're all human, we're all on this planet together, everything seems to be beautiful, but how in the hell, who came up with the first envision of coming up with any kind of a monster? Do you know what I mean? Like, monster in movies, monsters in cartoons, monsters, monsters in a story, whatever the case. Who came up with the first vision or caricature or drawing of a monster? How did they come up? How did the first humans who came up with a monster story come up with the monster? Right? I mean, let's face it. You're plopped on the face of this planet, buck naked in the middle of nowhere and out in all those beautiful uh, mountains and rivers and valleys and oceans and you're living, and you're living naturally and having a, having a riot, how would a monster story come about originally? Are you picking up what I'm putting down and making sense? Like I'm trying to be with an absolute innocent group of people who have never been stained in any way. They're living a natural life 
gathering food, doing whatever they're doing. They're just rocking it out on this beautiful round ball. And all of a sudden, somebody comes up with a monster story to scare the kids. Okay, fair enough. But who did that the first time and how did they come up with the description? <laughs> right? Am I making any sense? I think I am. It's not thought, right? Anyway, let's have a look behind me. Down the river. You hear a logging truck going by. River bank. Now, let's see if I can't get another one shared. All right, I wedged the uh, GoPro handle into the bank under some ferns. Just make it a little more easier. Now, thanks for sending that in. Keep us posted on what, whatever come, else comes your way. Hopefully uh, nothing bad. I'm sure Dave Platus will probably be interested in hearing that story from me if you get a chance to email him. All right, what's this one? This is titled, Oregon Coast Encounter. Hey Steve, please don't use my full name. You can use Pat. I work in the aerospace industry. Given the current climate, this insignificant information could have a major effect too old to start another career. My wife and I have been watching your channel for about six months now. I currently live not too far south of you, about 25 miles north of Seattle, and have boated up into the San Juans and your area many, many times. God's country. I truly appreciate you bringing all of us together to tell our stories, bringing back memories, and to know what we're, and to know that we're not alone. God bless you. First, sorry for this long-winded email. I don't have any sensational story to tell, but since listening to other stories, I've had memories brought, brought back of what I now believe may have been encounters with the forest people. I grew up in Tillamook, Oregon. The mountains are steep and the woods are extremely dense and seemingly end endless, making for difficult travel, but easy to disappear. I've always loved going up into the woods or along the many rivers that pass through the area. Great salmon and steelhead fishing. Not much of a crowd lover, and going out into the woods always made me feel at ease, like I was at home. When I was in grade school, it was not unusual for my mother to drive my best friend and I up the Wilson River, maybe a good 8 to 10 miles distance on road, and drop us off with the log truck sized inner tubes to float down the river to another friend's family dairy farm. It was a good long day to do as the river was much wider than the road, and you passed through many slow moving pools and extreme rapids. I don't remember ever hearing any stories about the Save. In fact, the only time that I can remember hearing of them was a story in the Oregonian from sometime in the early 70s, around high school era, regarding a woman who claimed to have a Bigfoot run into the side of her car on one of the remote highways and broke her driver's door window. I was in Bosberg, the Bosberg cripple print. At the time, we all thought she was either covering something up or looking for a moment of fame. I do remember the picture in the article of her black eye and cuts on her forehead. The fact that this was the only story I can remember could just be that I was too busy being a kid. I used to go up the Wilson River to fish and swim and, and dropped off by myself while my mother would drive farther up river to pick blackberries and make jam. The water was very cold and when you dove in, it'd feel like a hatchet had just gone through your head. This was exaggerated by the fact I loved to swim underwater and up the rapids as far as I could. But if you swam very fast and hard, you would build up heat and start to enjoy the water. The area, I'd be, the area I would generally go had a large gravel bar on one side of the river and a steep forested mountain on the other, which came right down to the water. It was not unusual for me to hear large rocks crash into the water, and what I can only describe now as wood knocks. At the time, I believe this is just the forest and the earth just moving. Natural sounds. But thinking back, I don't remember hearing those rocks crashing down the mountain only hitting the water. Oddly, now as I type this, I don't see how the trees moving would make the knocks either. I hunted a bit as a teenager, but again never felt any fear or heard any of the screams described by other members here. But I can remember times when I felt like I was being watched, or sometimes just felt uneasy. I never saw or heard any reason for these feelings, but they were real. These feelings would cause me to pack it up and leave. I'm now 66 years of age. I don't know that any of these memories were actually encounters with the Sabe, but interesting that the memories have come back to me after so many years after hearing, sorry, after hearing other stories. Was the Sabe, was it warning me to, to protect me or that I was trespassing? I'll never know. 
My story is not exciting, but makes me wonder how many of us have had encounters but don't realize it. Just like the encounters with wild animals, sometimes they're known as we can see them or identify their distinctive calls, but how often have they passed close to us and we are completely unaware of them, as we just weren't able to relate the sound or something no to something known. Like most things in life, it seems that we, the more we learn, the less we realize that we know. How often today is scientific fact being overturned by new information? Again, thank you for all you do. Be safe and strong. Pat, maybe another member of the club of no return. Pretty sure you remember, dude, <laughs> right? Said it before. You go out of your way to email us here. You already know what it was. You're just uh, sharing that fact somewhere safe with many people that have the exact same experience, right? Always look up, they say. Big trees here. Thanks for your time emailing us, man. Send it in, send in more if you come across more in the, uh, in the future, all right? Here's another one. This is titled, Brief and to the Point. Steve, I thought it might be useful to tell you that I appreciate the people's stories. They're good stories. Five years ago, I suffered a massive stroke. I was not expected to survive. Actually, I had no fewer than five strokes wrapped up in one event. One of the lingering effects was that my creative juices went away. I'd been a writer, which suddenly I was unable to do. That sucks dick. How the hell does that work? That's shitty. As an author, that's a big deal. I'm a guy who is not inclined to cowardice. Rather, I like the underdog, the guy who ignores his fear and fights the bully. I'm the guy who doesn't quit. The stories help me find the writer inside me again. I have a goal to publish my writings, essays, poems, short stories, etc. Thanks for doing what you do. They help me. By the way, life is a series of stories in which we are the characters. By the way, I am not a member of the club or no return directly, nor do I ever want to be. I do not. My name is Adrian Horian living in Hartford, Wisconsin. Adrian, absolutely appreciate that positive email, man. Absolutely stoked that, that uh, this is, help, this is help, helping you and helped you out. It's good news. Makes me sick when I hear people lose either their, their ability to or their drive to enjoy their passions in this lifetime, right? That's why we're here. Comes another one. Feeling of being watched. How do you even use my name of cho chosen? My name's Randall Carroll from Central Florida and had an experience while visiting my uncle up in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia slash Eastern Kentucky. He lives way back in a hollow called Flint Gap. The homestead he built was, was named the middle of the world by him and my aunt because it's just an amazingly beautiful and very remote place. His nearest neighbor is at least 10 miles away. While visiting him, I decided to take a ride in my Jeep to try to get familiar with the area. As I was driving up an old logging road, I came up a very old plot of graves. The graves were so old, the stones were just large, flat shards of sandstone with no identical names or dates on them. As I stood there, I got this overwhelming feeling of being watched. Steve, I grew up hunting, and the woods has always been my second home. Being of Cherokee descent, this is how I was raised, and being in the deep woods is simply second nature for me. But I've never in all my 53 years on this earth felt such a feeling of being watched like that. It literally shook me up, Steve. I began to look around and scanning the tree lines in order to spot the person who was watching me, but I didn't see anyone. It was dead silent up there as well. No birds chirping, no bugs buzzing, not even a breeze blowing to break the deafening silence. I quickly, almost in a panic, got back in my Jeep to get the hell out of there when I heard three loud tree knocks followed by a falling tree. The knocks were loud as shit, and the falling tree even louder. I spun head around to look in the direction of the knocks and falling tree, and I seen this good-sized birch tree laying on the ground not 40 yards from where I was standing. And standing at the base of this birch tree, <laughs> seen that shadow on the river. Bad move beside me, that was creepy. Sorry. And I seen 
This good sized birch tree laying on the ground not 40 yards from where I was standing and standing at the base of this birch tree was a huge sabe standing there looking at me. I could clearly see this big fella and even the expression on his face. Steve, this guy was pissed. He had a grimace on his face like he wanted to kill me. Even sitting here thinking about it gives me goosebumps all over my entire body. Man, I've always said there's two things in life that I'm scared of, and that's lightning and my mother. But now, Steve, after my encounter, I've added a third to my list. I'll never go back into the woods alone again without my sidearm or rifle. It was truly an encounter I will certainly tell my grad grandchildren about one day. Thanks for taking the time to read my story, keep up the great work, and good luck bagging that giant grizzly, bro. Polk County, Florida. Okay, man. Uh, Randall, I can use your name, Randall Carroll. Randall, people are gonna want a description of it, what you saw, it's up to you. Most of us know what you saw. If you wanna write back a detailed description, man, give her. I wonder why they do that. I wonder why they stand there staring at us like they wanna rip our frickin' faces off. I don't get it. I don't get it. All right, this looks like a bit of a, oh yeah, this is a book. <laughs> All right, screw it, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna do this one, and then I'm gonna try to get up the guts to jump in that water behind us to see what's in there. Good morning, Steve. Ha ha, I love that letter. Welcome to the club of no return. I've been a subscriber to Howard Hunt since before you began to open the Enigma. I followed you because I drew a once in a lifetime mountain goat hunt in Utah, where my tribe is. I was curious of how a white man hunts and found that your channel was all I needed. <laughs> Like all hunters, we study. I found your character honest and hunting truthful to the land and at the animals and yourself. The mountain goat hunt was an adventure. I missed my shot by one meter. Ouch! Of course, I did the worst thing anyone can do, and I used my son's gun, not my own, calibrated to 100 yards. Haha. <laughs> Shooting too high when I was laying on a boulder. That sucks. I can still see my, my son's face. Mom, I told you it's dead on at 300. Always a good hunting story. I always remember seeing the cloaked insect creatures flee from me. At 10,000 foot elevation when I was furious, a whole valley was silent and manipulated, the game was absent, and the land would reveal the cloaked. I always could see them, and they could only feel my true presence, so they would flee. But like so many others here at the club in a return have said and witnessed, they would seek to hunt me too, want to abduct me, always since I was little like two warriors of different creeds claiming the dark, waiting for one to move. That is how I lived claiming their reality and this, the third dimension, for the purpose to end this game, the war that everyone forgot. Omega, the state of Omega. I recently gave up hunting and, as I felt the need to accept a greater calling, as was told me years ago, after the death of my younger brother, and the need to care and the need to carry his purpose forward. I guarded his last eight years battle, I guarded his last eight years battle with pancreatitis, watching him die 12 times. Oh, that sucks, until his purpose called him to die. I'd always protected him, his older sister, four years his elder. Our childhood was very difficult as most of the reservation and the poverty of the 80s. His loving and bright gentleness was precious to me. His life was on my guard, my watch, so I lived as a knight to a king. His death ended that purpose, and his greater calling became mine, as any fallen warrior would give. His purpose was to teach and heal, completely contrary to my true purpose. But again, I always knew the war, the game plans, and my own directive, that all warriors seek and sacrifice to peace. A warrior we may know is Heoka, to the Lakota. The samurai have a creed of this purpose as well, a contraire, the opposite, the mirror to one's true being. This way I practiced since I was small, taught by my father, U.S. Army Airborne Green Beret Special Forces E-9. Needless to say, a little girl living in the shadow of my father in itself was a juxtapose naturally. So I've been hidden within the truth, like all of us who know our true selves. It is understood by many tribes that the true human is not yet born, and that is why I'm writing you. 
I've seen them, though, in the generation now being born. When you are, when you are silent and beyond fear, you can feel them. The pressure of them forces the beings of other purpose to utter fear. It's truly amazing. Anyway, you asked directly to know, and I've been hearing for days prior to your most recent video, to help, and it's time. So, today, as I have your most recent video paused, want to honor both my purpose and yours, secrets of truth and clarity, as you ask to know, to remember, and the true self, the invisible war that everyone forgot. Nearly two years ago, I saw the first of the higher angels return. I am one. He spoke as his horse ascended on a black horse. As his horse ascended on a black horse. They touched the earth at the opposite side and now have made it here to this side. In fact, the wake of his power is so close. So, it makes sense. This need to know, need to say. Years ago, when my brother was still well enough, we sat at the lake's edge, woke angels looking forward into these days, knowing what would come, sitting as two, me shattered, tattered from endless struggle, he woke and dealt the ill. He woke me, healed me, and trusted me, the most deadly warriors born in this world for a single task to destroy it all. If they foiled us. What the F is with all these aliens crammed in here with us? I asked him. They came to watch, mostly, to watch the greatest Super Bowl in creation. I found them to be the most annoying, and they angered me quite a bit. Maybe, same as you, I imagine. So, who are we? I asked the same thing. It isn't anything much to creation, a human body like a bubble of water electrified to purpose for only a brief memory, not a big deal. My brother reminded me of the true human. Remember, when you were little and you had a favorite teddy bear or toy, he said, you gave his soul. Steve, you gave Mr. Macaroni a soul. He lived in your time. He gained a soul. Something aliens can't do and something that did at one time not ever thought was possible. A true human is the most dangerous creation of all. We sat at the lakeside that day, two of one, and I remembered a memory from my living in the human life prior to being woke. A simple memory when I was shopping with my son and living happy day to happy day and the universe blasted through to me. The universe is binary. I thought of that in the moment when we sat together on the lakeshore, two of one. My brother, peace and suffering, and me, warrior and fallen. He didn't know the things I knew. He was concerned over the days beyond, the death, the virus, the day that he called three days, the days of shock when the aliens are seen. We saw it all. The universe is binary. I told him zero and one. I remember the absolute beginning before OM. The song of God began, splitting creation into two, zero and one. I remembered. He remembered the ancient separation, light and dark, zero and one. But he'd forgotten the gain to be had, if a true human could do it. Something worth the cost of all souls would be possible. Within zero is perfect order, a place that haunts us. The order and perfection of the very mathematical, beautiful perfection of chaos, infinite and zero. As the song of creation extended something happened in perfection, an anomaly, a singular place was born, one. One drew out forward through the perfect order of chaos, zero. The song of creation shot forward like a bullet, cutting perfect zero. A shadow realm and song, the souls are threaded into the current of one and in the frequency of P.I. Each soul is woven into it. Singular points of truth, unique, divine, an enigma, precious and singular. We sat together. I knew this part of the war. It's hard to see because we only share specific orders, specific duties, hidden because of the game, the mind altering, the manipulation we would endure to reach here. Evil rose in the realm of zero, stuck in perfect chaos of no value, no danger, no expression to life. One. The song of God held life, safe from zero, side by side in creation, and it was good, even as the Bible says, until a blip in the souls happened. Time was created and self was given to souls. Nothing big to all the force of life, just a human presence opening to witness self. But something remarkable happened and they could choose evil. Humans then were isolated here on earth to keep creation safe while they grew destroyed multiple times millions of failures each soul given choice infinite and always kept and harbored on earth 
the enigma of creation. What about God? I asked my brother. God wants no part of this, he told me. Fair enough, it is horrible to see the acts of the less humans. I thought, easy enough to destroy. God the Creator only gave us two things, soul and choice, he explained. What about Jesus? I asked him. He never left the earth, he explained. Then I remembered the purpose, the whole reason for the game, earth. This is Jesus' plan, planet, the planet of peace, where war was given free expression, hate and rage side by side, love and joy, both set to the human to choose. The most dangerous beings, the most glorious beings, pinched off from true creation because of our volatile and most dangerous potential. Quote, all the creation tried to make it in before we were closed in to witness the greatest birth in creation, my brother explained. We only spoke of it briefly, safely in the mountains, and we both knew what would come. In these two, in these two decades it began, the point where all in zero was allowed to come into one in the form of human. The most dangerous potential, evil was given rise to creation by choice, by voluntary forfeit of the soul in this realm of humans. The Mandela effect was the point that closed us in, the last souls that could withstand placed in the hands of God. No wrongs, no rights, no judgment, no blame. Only choice would be honored. Like a ball of dough pinched in to keep creation safe and to facilitate the greatest trick. The greatest strategy to complete the humans, we accomplished it. We won the war. The moment reality closed in 2012 and all hell was allowed in and we who were chosen could stand the last times. We made it to the greatest game of all, players hidden, game plans unknown to do one task of our generation. Those outside the dough ball earth are waiting to be born. Their cheers alone can shatter all evil, but we must finish this first. That time is now. Long way to get to, as you ask, who the hell are we? What are we naturally and can't anymore? Who the hell are we? A true human is the goal of all souls. The first humans born of presence with a connection to zero opened a potential, born with connection through the shadow, where only one thing protected the soul. It wasn't anything except a counterbalance to hold the souls in the expression of guardian angel, given the task to protect the soul. Until the zero shadow became aware and took control of the soul, took choice because a human would choose harm, self-harm, self-destruction, and ill will to others. So the protector stepped in front of the soul and with the only directive to protect the soul at all cost, it became evil, a demon, a shell of choice and took the soul to zero. The demon entered the realm of one. Every dangerous, very dangerous, but a potential was seen. One worth all souls willing, all souls who believed it was worth the cost. We came two directions to come here. One is to fall, the other is to rise. We made it to the game. Two thirds of all souls here and now, and now would choice to forfeit their souls, the trophy, to evil. The trophy is the heart of the seat of the soul, the blood sacrifice so often and sadly offered in human history. The other one-third tested in this third dimension would become true humans. They would never get at the end of all the horror, the disassociation to creation. They would never lose their heart, cease their soul, deny their choice. That was the playbook, the agreement that each of us made. Each of us with set game plans woven into our codes, our souls, hidden from those that would seek to manipulate the game, seeking the right souls to harbor, to control as pawns, trophies. But the game has a trick, a potential, because evil would never be allowed out. It is only a choice, and we agreed to be here together, villain and victim, guilty and innocent. It is a trick, test, to see what the soul would, would choose. And those who always choose evil will be removed. But the zero souls who brought evil to one actually took the hardest and most notable deeds. They forfeit to trick evil here where we could overcome it forever. And that is what we do in our generation, the next 70 years. But we have help. The new generation is being born now that came from outside the dough ball world. They come with clear directives and clear powers. 
They do not need to do our task when we with demons overcome, we too must forget the warrior ways. So it is, this planet, the planet of peace, we do this. This question you need to ask is, who are you? Remember, know thyself, your creed, your origin. Your home place is beyond this place. You find that place in the beat of your heart and with true purpose, you are born on the battlefield. Where you are very important and very much loved and honored. I hear the celebrations all the time. I ask my late brother, when will we know it is done? How bad will it get when evil thinks it wins? So, and yes, there's so much more. I'll find a way to help as I can, and you have been such a great scout in this time, and here we are, hunter to hunter, no longer hidden. I commend you, and we have a long way to go. I honor your journey as well as David Pilatus, who also set his vision in this direction. Perfect. Both validated my presence and memory to perfection. I hope to again write to him, or hope he hears this too, as I have shared things with him too. There is no right or wrong, no good or bad. There is no judgment. You cannot take sides. You cannot blame one another, my brother told me. So I came to peace with the demon I brought, to be at peace on the battlefield, surrendered it, and now stand. I will tell you, Steve, it is impossible to make a wrong move. And the most dangerous thing in this world is yourself and the demon that is in you. I'm confident yours will come to a glorious conclusion, and I pray you remember your very specific purpose. As for what can we do and what have we forgotten, we can manipulate this reality, manifest all potential, express all choices. Most dangerously, we give soul. Humans can love a rock and give it soul. Love bacon and give it soul. Hate and create demons. Yep, pretty dangerous. The hunters of the other dimensions come here to study soul. Some involved in the game, most are curious and stupidly forget that they were told not to be seen or manipulate. Next to the human dimension is the dimension of the Bigfoots, where they too have a war. Their telepathy and ultra-human frequencies are like slices of bread next to one another. We live in the human dimension, actually the most coveted and dangerous. The evil that thinks it is winning uses patterns, mind control, and technology to harness control in the direction of rising. Is that a pebble or a leaf? Whatever. That is why they fear fallen angels. But no matter how we got here or the journey, we don't lose one soul. Welcome to the club of no return on the battlefield of Nirvana. Just wait after the angel of death is done and the, and the veil is dropped and the aliens are clearly here. Brace yourself. One third, we got this. We have done this to perfection and we are in good hands. Know thyself, remember, and never lose heart. I hope you're well, I hope you enjoy your day, and I hope this helps you. There's so much to the game, the players and all the parts. That is why your work is so important. You have provided many with a broad view, always. Truth is relative to points of truth and seen whole. Only through togetherness and honesty can we become truly one. Always here with the living and grateful for the journey, fearless and flawed, but standing. Thank you, Mariah. Wow. There's something for some of you to chew on or pass over. Take from what you will or leave it. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to read that again and again. Once I'm home by myself and there's nothing going on around me. That was very, very interesting to me. Maybe to some of you too. Well, I guess I better get my, uh, get my ass in that water. Quit being such a chicken shit. Because it's so freaking cold. I guess I can't find and film any steelhead underwater unless I go in, right? I didn't bring my fishing rod. But that's one hell of a share, Mariah. That's one hell of a great share. Very, very interesting to say the least. And that's got the wheels turning on many, without a doubt. I'm going to go back and revisit that email again when I get home. And I'm going to read it again slowly and thoroughly. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Now, anyway. My legs have fallen asleep. My ass is falling asleep on this rock. I gotta move and I'll be back in a bit.
walk along rivers. That's what you want to do when you want to bump into something. Works for me anyway. <laughs> I didn't say I wanted to bump into something though. 